Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for coming to this really, really exciting event. I am Sri Sarma. I'm the Vice Dean for Graduate Affairs in the Whiting School of Engineering, and I'm also an Associate Professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. I'm thrilled to welcome you to the Spring 2022 Eileen Bush Vichniak Lecture. This is a lecture we're always excited to host, but this year it takes on an ex extra special meaning because it's the first in-person lecture since fall 2019. So really excited about that. This lecture was established by a group of alumni, um, a group of alumni of faculty who wanted to recognize Dr. Eileen Bush Vishniak for her contributions to the Whiting School during her tenure as Dean. The lecture provides the opportunity for an accomplished woman to come to campus to speak. Dr. Bush Vishniak served as a faculty member at various institutions before coming to Hopkins in 1998 to serve as Dean of the Whiting School of Engineering, becoming the school's first and only female Dean. She remained at Johns Hopkins until 2007. During her tenure at, as Dean, Dr. Bush Vishniak helped attract more research funding and emphasized aggressive recruitment of students and faculty from diverse backgrounds in particular. Undergraduate engineering enrollment rose more than 20% and the school almost doubled in terms of the number of its research centers. She has served as the lead supervisor for 18 PhD students, 34 master's students, and a host of undergraduates engaged in research and projects and she's also received several teaching and research awards during this time. I am honored that Dr. Bush Vishniak is here with us today here in the front row. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. So now I'm pleased to introduce our spring 2022 Eileen Bush Vishniak lecturer, Dr. Elizabeth Libby Adams. Libby Adams is a clinical rheumatologist with more than 29 years of clinical development and international clinical trial experience. Most recently, she was the senior medical director in infectious diseases at BioNTech, where she was focused on prophylactic vaccines for COVID-19, TB, HCV, and HIV. In addition, she has performed clinical trial research on treatments for autoimmune diseases, HIV and TB. She has also worked on prophylactic vaccine development against Ebola, Marburg, and, the neuro, and neurovirus diseases. She earned her bachelor's degree in bioengineering and biomedical engineering here at Johns Hopkins and her MD from the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine. She went on to do her residency at Penn State College of Medicine before spending four years at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. With that, we are very excited to have you. Dr. Adams, welcome. Zoom. Okay, great. So a very great thank you to the School of Engineering for inviting me to give this talk. I am deeply honored and humbled. Also, thanks to all of you for taking time out of your very busy study and research schedules. This talk will provide you with one perspective on what it is like to transition from engineering to medicine into vaccine development. I end with vaccine development because no other intervention improved worldwide public health in the prior century other than water sanitation. <clears throat> For your reference, the World Health Organization updates a list of the top 10 conditions impacting public health. I'm sorry, I'm really having trouble talking with the mask on, so I am going to move it. I apologize very much. Uh, I would prefer to keep it on. Um, <clears throat> before, 
Before providing a high level overview, I will begin with this quote recently published in the journal Nature Medicine. The Nature article is relevant for anyone in academics who has interest in advancing mentorship of young women in science and engineering. The consideration for mentorship must be done proactively for women participating, particularly in their graduate school and early research careers, where women's career tra trajectories begin falling behind men's. The situation has become proportionally more dire since COVID, and the funneling effect has the potential to become more severe in numbers when one considers that more women than men now are entering college. The article did not address the most likely much more abysmal conditions or situation for the economically disadvantaged minority women. There's more and more data to demonstrate that if women are not enabled to contribute to areas of research and academics throughout the hierarchical academic structure, then society at large will suffer not only because we're missing the potential of 50% of the workforce, but because of the additional perspectives that 50% brings in boosting innovation, productivity, and creativity from different points of view. When gender parity exists, as it most closely does in Iceland, society at large benefits in making use of all its resources. And to the younger women, mentorship works best as a two-way street. When you consider a career in engineering or science via the academic route or another venue for research, it is critically important you also take initiative. Reach out, find, and accept support and encouragement from all varieties of colleagues and what I will call mini mentors. Mini mentors are those who temporarily provide support and encouragement in times of challenge and can provide helpful and at times differing perspectives, which may assist in overcoming those challenges we all face at multiple times during our career. However, hopefully each of you will come across an authentic mentor during your career, meaning someone who believes in you and specifically helps to further your career with now, without necessarily expecting something in return. Other than the mentor theme I will allude to during this talk is, is the theme of the brick wall, which Randy Pausch refers to in his last lecture. For those of you who don't know Professor Pouch, he and his graduate students developed the training software, Alice. Everyone hits the brick wall, including the most successful, but the so most successful take lessons from the challenges, do not perseverate on them and move forward. This talk is mostly directed to women college and graduate students and first time job seekers. I hope I can provide you a few insights on career navigation, transitions, challenges, and skills to acquire based on my very nonlinear career path. But of course, everyone moves at their own pace. And I hope yours is more direct than mine was. First, I will provide some observation from my college years and potential benefits from taking years off from school or career, if that is financially feasible. I will provide you a perspective on medical school coming from Hopkins as an engineer, and then how residency fellowships and laboratory experiences contribute to overall knowledge and enable flexibility and creativity in subsequent career steps. I will interview, I will summarize some of my interview experiences for career moves and last some of my thinking on relative pros and cons when working in either the US government, nonprofits, biotech or biotech pharma sectors. During the talk, there will be a few recommended podcasts or videos. Before coming to Hopkins, I wanted to be a ballet dancer. I went through many debates and emotional discussions with my parents on this topic. They were academically oriented and disproved of this career path. Because I excelled in math during high school and my father came from 
an engineering family. My parents hoped I too would become an engineer. Ultimately, I negotiated a deferred admissions approach to college so I could take a year off and see if I could make it professionally as a dancer. I was fortunate they agreed to and were able to provide some financial support that year that I was apprenticed to Hartness Ballet School. Unfortunately, or perhaps rather fortunately, I developed a back injury that gave time for me to think about the many opportunities that would open up if I did go to college. And I also came to terms with the realization I could never be as good as I wanted to be as a dancer in New York City. The year off left me more motivated to return to school with new goals and a sense of purpose in mind. So when arriving at Hopkins, I was to be an engineer, but I also knew I enjoyed biology as much, if not more than math. I thought I may later move on to grad graduate school in bioengineering, biophysics, or even biology-oriented fields. But I discovered for freshman year that I surprisingly preferred to socialize with the pre-medical students and the engineering or science students. I think this was partly because it seemed to be more people-oriented and probably because the subjects were just easier for my mind to grasp in the way it worked. So to have a better idea of what it might be like to work as a phys physician, I tried several volunteer opportunities at Hopkins Hospital and Maryland Shock Trauma Unit. And I did prefer working in the medical group atmosphere relative to what I anticipated to be long hours in labs, analyzing data, sitting in front of the computer when I envisioned what a path would be like for engineering or science. Of the course, the world has now changed where large collaborations have become necessary to perform the best cutting edge science, but I did not see this path at the time. I took them MCATs and ended up, as all pre-medical students did, in the office of the pre-medical dean, who advised students on their career paths. He told me, in no uncertain terms, I should not be applying to medical school but to continue in engineering. While my engineering advisor and parents agreed with him, none of my male pre-med friends experienced this tenor of discussion with the Dean. I was devastated and the discussion certainly did not help my confidence. However, I knew I still was on the right path and knew myself best. So the summer after junior year, I found a lab job at the medical school I anticipated I would most likely get into. In hindsight does suggest this probably did help my medical school application. Another self-discovery that occurred for me at Hopkins was my love for the learning atmosphere. And that I would always want to be in a job where there were new topics to learn, new problems to solve and new answers to discover every day. Also my love of learning kept me going in spite of my less than stellar grades at the time. I also observed from my Hopkins hospital and laboratory experiences that to obtain an academic job and, and tenure, it was much easier to do so if one were funded by research grants. A last vignette from college to share with some of the college students during my last semester senior year. To graduate as an engineer, I needed to complete six semesters of upper level math. But statistics, which I had been very much looking forward to, was not offered at the time. The only course available which fulfilled the engineering graduate requirement was graph theory. Arriving in the class, I immediately knew I was going to be in big trouble. Half the other students were part of the Hopkins Child Prodigy program, and there was one other woman. The guy I was sort of dating at the time who agreed to help uh, with the class and because he was a math major, well, he broke up with me in the middle of the semester. I was barely passing the course and so depressed that one of my college roommates would regularly check in on me while doing her internship in DC, for which I'm forever grateful. So two points to this. 
if in any way possible, try not to save the most difficult class for your last semester. And second, even if statistics is not required for your major, it is the course I would most recommend for anyone, including liberal arts majors, because bias and understanding of bias uh, provides a perspective on data. And very few scientists and engineers, in my experience, considering bias when discussing the results or even making critical resource decisions. To summarize some considerations from my college years, it probably is the best time in your life to explore new fields of study that one may not have time to explore in the future. And more importantly, Please don't let other people's expectations dictate what you choose to study or explore. At this point in your life, there's plenty of time for failure. Additionally, because time is the most precious of resources, know that you are in control of how you spend your time and use it wisely. Maintaining control of your free time has only become more difficult with smartphones and social media. Do not let the social algorithms, media algorithms, control the dopamine release in your brain and also suck up your sleep time and time that is better spent face-to-face -face with friends. Both of these activities, sleep and face time with friends, are known to be rejuvenating and assisting with mental resilience. One podcast I have referenced explains that data on cheap sleep now shows sleep deprivation not only makes you dumber, but decreases your lifespan similar to cigarette smoking. Last but not least, a little help from friends goes a long way. And I recommend always feeling comfortable asking for help or even better providing it because teaching is the best way to learn. Listed here are some of some very short podcasts and YouTube videos uh, for inspiration or references that provide data informa and information on what I've discussed. Once arriving at medical school, I have to say for me personally, the first two years were probably the most tedious and difficult time of my life. Honestly, I never really acquired or perfected the skill of massive short-term memorization since the courses I took at Hopkins prioritized reasoning, synth synthesizing data, and creativity to a greater extent. Medical school was similar to learning a new language for me. I also experienced some culture shock arriving at a Southern school, the mindset of the majority of my fellow male students at Hopkins had been relatively different. Most were serious about their studies and many students were first generation attendees or children of immigrants. Medical school was the first time in my life I had to deal with overt chauvinism and misogyny. On the other hand, the third year of medical school, the clinical year was fabulous, even though it presented its own challenges such as coming off a rotation at midnight to find the radiator of my car stolen. Third year medical school confirmed my love of learning and working in a team environment, but also reinforced I want to be involved in answering problems and finding ways to improve people's lives if possible on a larger scale. I chose internal medicine and with the residency match, I hope to end up at a hospital in one of the Northeast cities. Instead, I found myself in the middle of cow country at Hershey Medical Center. But this was a great blessing in disguise. Not only were the medical attendings some of the most knowledgeable and patient teachers I have come across, but for the first time, more than one clinical attending seemed interested in supporting my career path and well being. During residency, I also noticed I was generally less quick to react to frustrating situations than many of my colleagues, as it is very easy to become frustrated and angry when one is sleep deprived and other people are not 
owning up to their responsibilities. However, one morning, I also got into trouble when I was a senior resident on call, covering not only the medical wards with my interns, but the intensive care unit and emergency room for both internal medicine and neurology. I'm sharing this story as it illustrates how a good and fair supervisor should behave if you are lucky enough to run across such. So what happened, a young spina bifida patient with a spinal fluid shunt was in the emergency room complaining of headache and fever. He had been previously admitted to the hospital non-emergently with an infected shunt more than 22 times. After evaluation, the ER staff called neurosurgery who refused to see or admit the patient and asked the covering neurology resident to see the patient, which was me. By the time my evaluation was complete, having come off the floors, the patient had been in the ER for at least five hours. Because I believed the shunt was infected again, I called both the neurosurgery, then the neurology resident, both of whom still refused to evaluate or admit the patient. Now it was almost 3 a.m. The attending physician in the emergency room had become quite irritated. I had a call to my internal medicine attending to see if I could admit the patient, but it wasn't happening fast enough for the ER attending who told me I must move the patient as soon as possible since neurology admission, neurology had refused to admit him. I was almost in tears, appalled, exhausted, and frustrated. After he quipped, get him out of my ER, I called him an asshole. And so he reported me to the residency director. Fortunately, the internal medicine attending at the same time returned my call and said we could admit the patient to internal medicine. Now, no one ever wanted to be called into this residency director's office to be disciplined. He had the reputation for being extremely strict and severe and meting out punishment among my fellow residents. However, I was given the chance to explain my story, given the benefit of the doubt, and kindly advised for the future to take a different tact than calling people names. In other words, Always speak out for what is right, but do so civilly and continue to cultivate frustration tolerance. I remember this moment as it was one of the, a few times a person in relative power had my back. More often people were concerned about how they are perceived and if there's any immediate fallout that will affect their reputation. He was a definite check for a mini mentor. With many medical specialties, there is always the option to subspecialize, and I thought a subspecialty would improve my odds of going into academics. In the mid-1980s, there were allergists and immunologists at Hershey who treated autoimmune diseases, but no rheumatologists. There needed to be more and better treatments for lupus and scleroderma, however, than corticosteroids as used by allergists at the time. For example, in my clinic, I took care of a 16-year-old systemic lupus patient whose, whose growth plates had closed when she was three foot six and already had old lady osteoporosis. I also took care of a 23-year-old pregnant woman who died in the ICU from progressive systemic sclerosis. To confirm rheumatology was a subspecialty of interest, I did a month rotation at the University of Pittsburgh. After returning to Hershey, I set out the very supportive head of infectious disease who suggested some directors of immunology's, immunology labs whose work overlapped with clinical rheumatology. Because I knew I loved clinical medicine, but also wanted to get the best lab experience possible to enable an academic career, I specifically planned to start my rheumatology fellowship in the lab. In the late 80s, there was a dearth of American postdoctoral research fellows, particularly in immunology and rheumatology. 
So the majority of lab directors I reached out to uh, on this slide, listed on this slide at the bottom, paid for me to visit and interview at their institutions. Some of the interviews had repercussions years later because it is a small world. And so I will go into a little detail here. When I interviewed with the head of immunology at Harvard, he did not seem particularly interested in having me join his lab. However, I learned four years later, I misinterpreted that interview and his disinterest as you will hear. The Hershey uh, infectious disease mini mentor suggested I also interview with a famous scientist at Duke who unfortunately had just moved to Genentech. The new head of rheumatology encouraged me to visit Duke. However, it was the one group that did not pay for me to do so. As happened with other institutions, I interviewed with multiple laboratory directors, but not the head of rheumatology and was most interested in going into a retroviral lab in that division. However, when returning to the head of rheumatology, he seemed very displeased with my first choice, abruptly ended the interview, and on return to Hershey, my follow-up calls were not answered. At the time, the experience seemed rather bizarre, but it also left a bad taste in my mouth when I ran into this famous investigator many, many times during my years later at NIH. So one takeaway is if people do not seem enthusiastic from the get-go, move on as soon as possible. Nowadays, it seems uh, it, there's more help to prepare for interviews. And there are multiple coaches and websites LinkedIn has advice, and so uh, you can um, reach it or out to those references. For fellowship, I ended up favoring a lab at WashU, where the Howard Hughes lab chief was also head of rheumatology. His laboratory focused on the complement system, evolutionarily one of the oldest immune defense mechanisms around. Now, how labs are run by lab chief can be simplistically or grossly split into two generalized paradigms. Either the lab chief is fairly hands-on and helps select projects uh, for more junior re researchers, or the lab chief will have a limited number of projects and set multiple researchers on one project to see who can make the most important discoveries first. So either beating out everyone else on the project or having success on your own project is the most direct approach to advancing one's career. Furthermore, it is critical you are given or select a successful individual project to succeed. No matter what strategy is taken by the lab chief, there are always apparent individual preferences, some articulated, some for which there may be no un no, uh, no, no obvious reason, and some which blatantly don't make sense from the view of the subordinate researcher. Complaints about the situation often result in ostracism, but even if one's ever to complain, always, always, always come with a plan on how to move forward, and the discussion will end much better. The initial year in the lab, I struggled on multiple accounts and disappointingly, nothing seemed to be expected of me from the lab. After long hours and hard work on one group project where a very lazy male postdoc was awarded first authorship, I proposed my own project that would hopefully provide results within the two years I planned to spend in the lab. I was lucky that this project showed some traction and I was then provided some additional resources and the opportunity to stay a third year or even complete a PhD. By the end of my fellowship, my lab chief had become a partial or mini mentor and facilitated my job searches and the University of California system, some universities in Paris and at Harvard. For all these research jobs, I was told I would be required to obtain grant funding within six months. 
the head of immunology at Harvard did not want to support me for the first six months because I had turned him down previously. But the head of the Blood Institute stepped in and did offer to help. The timing was 1992 when the grant funding, especially for new researchers, was less than 8%. Furthermore, it seemed that the immunology field at large and relevant investigators who would be at peer reviewed grant applications had little interest in the complement system. Therefore, at the suggestion of another rheumatology attending at WashU, who had spent eight years in Dr. Fauci's lab, I also looked at some NIH immunology labs because there one could acquire more years of a lab experience without the requirement of simultaneously writing grants. And where did that first author physician researcher end up? He dropped out of his Harvard fellowship and went to work for a medical publishing company. I ended up at intramural NIAMS, the National Institute for Arthritis, Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases. And I went to a rheumatology, molecular immunology, and genetics laboratory. Intramural NIH is similar to an academic university where one works in the lab, runs, may run bench to bedside clinical trials, sees patients, and writes papers. Historically, these job roles intramurally are quite different relative to extramural NIH, which I will go into brief detail later. When I arrived at NIH, my lab chief proposed a research project which involved developing a muscle cell culture system for various analyses and was quickly initiated. Other research fellows at this clinical center approached me about collaborating on lab studies and yet others on their clinical studies in myositis, lupus, and rheumatoid arthritis. Intramural NIH provides a wonderful, scientifically engaging and collaborative atmosphere. However, I very quickly again realized my particular lab project was taking me down a rabbit hole because it was not going to be feasibly completed in a realistic time frame. I dutifully persisted as my boss insisted. Eventually, two years later, I proposed and two years too late, perhaps, proposed other laboratory projects. But in the meantime, I had contributed to several phase one clinical trials in lupus, rheumatoid, and myositis, something I had not anticipated when going to NIH. About this time, I realized to complete my new projects, I would probably need to spend another two years in the lab. And I was told I would not be put up for intramural tenure because my boss preferred to assist another fellow who he believed would not be able to support himself as an academic research where he thought I could. Simultaneously, the clinical director pressured my lab chief and myself to fill a rheumatology fellowship role as there were too few fellows. I wanted to desperately protect my lab time and I objected re to repeating a fellowship although I was happy to help out with clinic and ended up giving up my public health service slot, uh, which paid for my job and switching to a contractor. Two years later, I completed my lab projects, including metabolic mus disease, muscle disease gene studies, a kind MD PhD from Russia included me on, and I was principal investigator for a myositis trial that was submitted for publication. Looking back, one could consider these additional two to three years at NIAMS uh, after I was told I was, would not be put up for tenure may have underdone, undermined my career advancement. But the eight years of lab research did provide me with depth of knowledge that ultimately was necessary for my career advancement later in life. Also, I have not really told you anything about my personal life, which of course was happening at the same time. I've been focused on my career, but now quite unexpectedly at the age of 36 found myself engaged. 
In addition, I was regularly commuting to Vermont as my mother had metastatic breast cancer with multiple hospitalizations. So then with four and a half additional years under my belt, I began an academic job search. Rheumatology research positions at Georgetown, GW, and University of Maryland just were not available. My boss specifically called out he did not support me applying to a position at Hopkins. I traveled to interview with University of Rochester and Boston Medical Center, where the chief of medicine told me I did not have enough clinical experience and should focus solely on a laboratory job and grant writing. This in spite of me having a rheumatology, my own rheumatology clinic for more than seven and a half years and having directly worked at, on designing and enrolling and defending to IRBs several rheumatology trials. University of Rochester was a very dynamic and welcoming place, but I would have to also move for my husband who wished to stay at NIH, travel back and forth to DC as we wanted to start a family and still commute to Vermont for my mother who clearly did not have more years ahead of her. Ironically, at this time, the rheumatology research fellow whose career my boss promoted for tenure left to private practice, not even rheumatology, but to run a concierge internal medicine clinic. Therefore, I made a decision to move to an extramural NIH job at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases or NIAD to stay in town and have more control over my personal life. The position was enticing as I was to be special assistant to the director of allergy immunology and transplantation or DATE as it's called. DATE consisted of MDs and PhDs who oversaw NIAD's grants supporting basic immunology and many areas of clinical immunology, including allergy, transplantation, and autoimmune diseases. Over time, I was to become a grants administrator for the autoimmunity portfolio. Unfortunately, a couple of weeks before I arrived at date, the director left to head Juvenile Diabetes Foundation. The new acting director was so overwhelmed, he had not interviewed me and decided to place me under the oversight of his executive secretary. I was involved with various writing projects and hoped the situation would get better. It did not. On the other hand, I was advised by multiple parties who knew the situation, I should stay on the job at least one year, which did happen to be the time of probation for an FTE or full time government uh, position. I was dying to get out of there before six months were up. Without doubt, this was the worst or second worst year of my career. One thing I did learn, and one can always learn many things from an unfortunate situation, was how to effectively use email as my supervisor was expert at documenting any minor mix-ups, suggesting poor performance by the staff she wanted to get rid of. One day, I ran into a former medical school classmate in the parking lot. We had not been close friends because she had no time to socialize with her husband in residency and a newborn child. I did babysit for her a few times when in medical school. She was branch chief of the HIV adult treatment group at Division of AIDS. And it turned out she was looking for another medical officer with an immunology background to join her group. Whoops. Okay. So the HIV research branch had medical officers who worked with various NIAID funded networks to evaluate therapies for HIV, one being the AIDS clinical trial group or ACTG. For example, ACTG had performed some of the initial protease inhibitor trials with Merck back in the mid 90s uh, in Dinavir. The ability of DAIDS to sponsor clinical trials de-risked drug development 
for companies and enabled evaluation of combination therapies when drugs were made by different companies. These years were very exciting as the drug combinations were finally helping people with AIDS and turning HIV into a chronic disease more similar to rheumatoid arthritis. Medical officers worked with the various investigators in designing and implementing studies and monitoring the safety of the drugs and the quality of the data. We also got to work with some of the best statisticians in the world. Another reason AIDS was such a great place to work at the time was because the therapeutic program director who oversaw all treatment and diagnostic areas for HIV, including grants, et cetera, was a great manager, probably the best any of us would ever have. Similar to the time of, of COVID now, there was a lot of political pressure and he shouldered a lot of demands, both internal and external. Another reason he was liked was that the majority of staff felt their voices were being heard and thus worked even harder. Given my immunology in phase one experience, the first five years in the therapeutics program, I was assigned to studies that evaluated immunomodulator therapies and therapeutic vaccines for HIV infected people. In this role, one of my superiors over in the vaccine program at Dades put forward my name to perform a WHO consult on a therapeutic vaccine for which I traveled to Thailand. He was another mini mentor. Five years into the therapeutics program, around 2003 or four, unfortunately, one of my coworkers got serio seriously ill. So I assisted her with her phase four trial called ACGG5175. It was the first large multinational trial to evaluate several combinations of antiretroviral therapies in a research limited setting. Establishing the trial sites provided me the opportunity and great privilege to visit the research groups at many international sites, including those in Thailand, India, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Brazil, and Peru. ACG 5175 experience very much influenced my thinking for years to come. I no longer wanted to be involved solely with translational and exploratory studies. If possible, I wanted to contribute to evaluation of interventions that had the greatest potential to contribute to public health. Thus, when my colleagues in the vaccine research program at Dades asked me if I wished to be join them and be the medical officer on a multinational phase to be efficacy trial, vaccine trial, I quickly jumped at the chance. We collaborated with many other research organizations as well, including the NIH Vaccine Research Center, well known now for its COVID uh, strategies, the US military HIV research program, the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, in addition to the NIAID funded HIV vaccine trials network. To step back, because DAVES was sponsor for 95% of HIV vaccine studies, we saw a great breadth of clinical trials and held more investigational new drug applications or INDs in the Office of Vaccine than any single drug company. Why do I highlight this? Because it's an example that illustrates the potential impact people may have when working in a US government position. But, and for me, this was a great chance. The first six to eight years I was in the vaccine program were probably the most rewarding of my career, not only because of the potential for scientific and public health impact, but also because my colleagues were also very driven to move HIV vaccine evaluations forward as quickly as possible with the backing of another great leader and manager. And because I myself was able to build a clinically strong and diverse team. The vaccine program director probably gave me the best professional opportunity in my career. More specifically, she had me present efficacy data on the largest and only ever successful HIV vaccine study 
16,000 people in Thailand, that, um, which NIAID had funded. And I presented that data to Dr. Fauci. So personally, he was aware of my contributions to the HIV prophylactic vaccine endeavor. Nine years later, family life interceded again in a big way. My husband was offered a great opportunity in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And with the agreement of myself and my two daughters, we moved to New England. I was not ready to retire and took a job at Henry Jackson Foundation. This work encompassed some of the roles I had at NIH, but involved more hands-on work such as writing clinical trials, grant applications, and on-site clinical tr trial training. People at HDF were great colleagues and all were very dedicated to improving health. My only misgiving with the job was that I was not routinely on site in Bethesda and this face-to-face -face interaction where key scientific discussions occurred and most decisions were made. So when Takeda Vaccine Business Unit located in Cambridge contacted me I and asked if I wished to work on dengue or norovirus vaccines, I jumped at the chance. Although the operational clinical plans regulatory strategies are the same between government, nonprofit and private sectors, in industry there's more um, emphasis on process and documentation. The thinking in industry tends to be more focused and efficiency driven. Understandably, because bringing a successful product to market as fast as possible is the goal. The projects within Takeda Business Unit, Vaccine Business Unit, or VBU, were interesting, and it had a great young dynamic leader, but he was not a good manager. When joining the company, I had been previously told I had not been previously told my direct line manager was joining the same week I started. And I was, but I decided to make the most of this situation. He, my new manager, was encouraged to follow his supervisor style, which turned out to be the Stalinist approach to discussion. In other words, there was to be no scientific discussion. Therefore, in spite of the very interesting project, Within three months, I realized I needed to leave this position. My husband gave me all sorts of advice to navigate the politics as he initially did not want me to leave. But having been at a similar situation at date, I knew I was not going to mentally survive. It took me another six months while on that job to find another one that was scientifically interesting and in the Boston area. This global immunology medical officer role focused on drug development and evaluation of treatments for lupus. I had come full circle. The company was small enough that one could talk to the head of research and development, yet established enough to have procedures in place to guide operating functions. It seemed to be the best of all worlds, uh, meaning a mixture of pharma and biotech. Then SARS-2 virus took over the world. We quickly pivoted to, de evaluate, to develop and implement a phase one, two clinical trial evaluating the same anti-inflammatory drug that we were evaluating for lupus. The advent of COVID though reminded me how much I enjoyed working in the infectious disease space, in particular vaccine evaluation. From an infectious disease and, and public health view, one positive impact COVID had was to increase awareness of the importance of vaccines. Fewer and fewer companies were continuing to invest in vaccine development prior to COVID. Historically, vaccines take years to develop and do not provide great return on investment once they are licensed and marketed relative to any form of treatment. The bar is also much higher for safety as you're giving vaccines to healthy people. With COVID companies, we're now reaching out for people with vaccine development experience. Oops. Let's 
seems like sorry okay um so um BioNTech came knocking and I, I felt my experience would best serve um, the pandemic and the situation at large working with them. I, <clears throat> the uh, projects at BioNTech were extremely interesting and impactful. And it was working with very smart and dedicated colleagues and it was, of course, an extremely exciting time. Although BioNTech developed the Pfizer COVID vaccine, the company did not have any expertise in prophylactic vaccine development. Historically, their primary focus has been and probably remains therapeutic immunogens to treat oncologic diseases. The BioNTech philosophy partly led to some misunderstandings and miscommunications around vaccine development strategy on my part. So therefore now I have decided to at least temporarily step away for a breather from the 11 to 16 hours in front of the computer and address many personal goals, which have long been put aside. I prepared this slide summarizing my thinking on various sectors one may consider for work with some input from some colleagues. For sake of time, I will provide my perspective on a few of the statements as we're, we're getting short on time. First, it may seem I preferred my years in government. However, this is not completely correct as I very much like the industry emphasis on entrepreneurship and efficiencies to address goals. Also industry by necessity must be more self-directed and innovative relative to many of the more responsive roles found in government positions in science. Nonprofits are also self-directed but suffer from the money crunch in being able to move quickly and occasionally lack critical expertise. Before closing, I would like to refer you to uh, a uh, article recently published by Dr. Gaudian, uh, also in uh, Nature. And it's on, uh, she, she has been studying as a psychologist and social anthropologist, what makes a successful scientist. And as her title states, they are characteristics that can be coached and learned. I have bulleted her four main points, some of which are themes I've covered in my talk. Uh, and last, a summary of recommendations for you all to consider as you move through your tr trainings and on your career path. It may seem my career path has been more of an obstacle course, but it has been a very personally rewarding one for me. And that is my definition of a successful career. Thanks for your attention. And I would be happy to take any questions. Sorry, just gonna grab the mic here. Well, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Adams for walking us through such an inspirational professional journey and being so honest and sincere. I think it's extremely helpful to us. So we're gonna take questions and answers, okay? Um, and so I'll cover this side of the room and I think, Katie, Katie. we'll cover, okay, I'm sorry, we'll cover the other side. So any questions uh, and, for Dr. And, Adams? Um, one question I get sometimes is what's the difference between biotech and pharma in case anyone in um, pharma, you know, typically you think of established companies like Pfizer, Merck, uh, Takeda, uh, whereas bio, um, uh, biotech companies um, 
uh, focus or on more on early discovery of in biologics, not small molecules. And uh, they can have products come to market, uh, but they tend again to focus a little bit more on the discovery side of biologics. Okay. Any questions? And I'm happy to take any questions about COVID too. <laughs> Well, if I may, since I have the mic, I'm going to use it and ask you the first question. It's actually something very specific in your journey um, when you did the multinational trial. And you mentioned all these different countries you went to. And I actually have been to some. My husband's from Zimbabwe. And I know that obviously culture, government, policies are very different. So I'm curious what challenges you faced in running a multinational trial and dealing with all those differences to try to come up with data that's not biased, that can actually show and prove that something works globally? Um, I, th I, I think um, one advantage, we were sort of first there and um, a key item is that the actual data you collect um, and the characteristics of people must be the same across all sites. And uh, so the investigators from all these sites who had companion investigators in the US, we all got together and agreed on the data and what people would be eligible. And they were very uh, enthusiastic about taking the study to the IRBs as it was designed, because they also believed um, that uh, uh, showing the research would actually Im uh, improve their chances of bringing drugs into country and improving the local public health. So uh, they very much bought into um, the study and, and it's the investigator that has to advocate to the IRB, to the government. Um, you know, this, this study as it's designed is a good thing for our, our people. Thank you. Any other questions? Yep. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. I just wonder if you were to start again and you were back at square one, what problem do you think is the most interesting going on right now that you'd love to, to try to tackle? Um, I mean, I still love medicine, um, but uh, aside from that, uh, environmental uh, science, engineering, figuring out ways to deal with pollution, um, being creative that way would be the top of my list. And um, air pollution is, I believe, number one. It's either number one or number three on WHO's list. Um, another uh, environmental degradation concern is number one. I think you had a question. You had a question? Yeah, thank you very much for your time. Uh, during your lecture, you mentioned quite a few times when some of your peers may have, you know, left academia or went to more lucrative careers, didn't finish their fellowships. Could you, do you know why perhaps you decided to stay if, despite the difficulties when maybe some of your peers fell off the track? Yeah, I mean, we all have different intrinsic motivations, right? Um, and, um, I, ho I hope, you know, uh, my love for being in a learning atmosphere and really being challenged and then contributing and having an impact is what drove me. Um, and I, I was, you know, I, I was not financially crippled um, for a long time. I, I was single and was able to go where I pleased. My family was extremely upset when I went to St. Louis. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, other people have other pulls and, and um, 
you know, people talk about balance of career and life and whatever, but it's also a matter of prioritization. And um, um, because one can never achieve balance. Hi, Dr. Adams, thank you again for your talk. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the relationship between American culture or general society now in the public health sector. Given the past couple of years, it seems that there's been pretty much a tumultuous relationship between the public health sector, both at the local level and at the federal level with general society. And as someone who's worked both in the private and public sector, what are your thoughts on that general relationship? Um, no, it's it's a uh, outstanding and and uh, very important um, critical point. Um, I I think uh, I, I was telling some students earlier. I think as scientists and and I have an example from NIH. We don't do a very good job at explaining, um, you know, what we're doing to the public, the more general lay public, why we're doing it. And it's sort of that um, foundation of education that then uh, one can reflect back upon. I, I um, uh, you know, people, I think also I alluded to uh, statistics and bias, people, um, don't necessarily aren't trained at about how to look at data or information. Is scientific data immediately suspect, you know, rather than, okay, here's some data, how do I look at it? Um, and then I think as a society, we're much, uh, uh, we've become even more risk averse recently. Um, uh, you know, people take for granted in the U.S. Uh, the great health we have, not everyone, but, but you know, overall vaccines uh, do a great job. I mean, I, I have the personal example that my great grandmother was one of 11 um, children and nine of them died from diphtheria back in the 1880s. And, and you know, you never hear about that now, you know, um, or polio, for example. So, um, you know, people as healthy individuals, they just really have become risk adverse. Um, and uh, sometimes I give the example too of um, uh, my mother who hated to fly, but she wanted to quickly get to, from Boston to Baltimore. Uh, so she would drive. Well, she hated to fly because there was fear of flying, but flying's actually far safer than driving, you know? So um, it's a lot, of, a lot of things and the better we communicate always, the better off we'll be. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question. Hello, it was a wonderful talk. Uh, I was interested which job role was uh, quite intellectually challenging for you among all the roles you have taken up in your career. Uh, my key challenges and what else? Yeah, I was asking which was the most intellectually challenging role and how, how do you determine that? Could, could someone, I'm having trouble hearing, sorry. Could someone repeat the question? challenging role. <laughs> I haven't thought of that. <laughs> um, you know, right off, one might say BioNTech, but it, it was just um, the hours were so brutal. I think that influences my thinking. Uh, I actually believe um, um, probably my bioengineering years. <laughs> and then um, um, 
I, I um, medical school is what it is. Um, uh, I, I think um, probably, you know, the lab work I did uh, at, at WashU. Great, thank you. I can attest to BME. I'm not surprised you said that. It's my home department and these students are spectacular, crazy prodigies. It's, it's an incredible place. Um, well, I guess we're gonna conclude today's program, but a few things. Well, first I'd like to thank you again. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you. you're fantastic. You're a leader in your field. You're an inspiration to Hopkins engineers. And I'd also thank like you. to thank Dr. Bush Vishniak for coming today uh, to our lecture and all you for coming and attending and listening. What I'd like to do now is just invite you all to network with each other as well as our esteemed guests. Um, but before you leave, we do have a small treat. So please don't forget to stop by and grab your little bag. Um, and thank you again and have a wonderful evening.